So Andrew, do you want to give it another minute or do you want to go ahead and start? Because it's just 2.17. Yeah, we can start. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our SUNY Law Conference 2021. Uh, I am Violet Price. I am your moderator for today's session, and it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you Andrew Nagy from EBSCO. Andrew is Director of Software Innovation at EBSCO, and he works directly with libraries to help support the development of the Folio Library Services platform in the entire EBSCO SAS portfolio. Prior to coming to EBSCO, uh, Andrew was one of the initial developers for Summon Discovery Service and eventually became the lead production manager for Discovery at ProQuest. Earlier, Andrew was a technology development specialist at Villanova University's library where he founded and launched the open source discovery tool, ViewFind. So at this time, I am going to turn it over to Andrew, and before I turn it over to you, actually, I just want to say thank you on behalf of SUNY Law uh, for being one of our sponsors again for this oh, yes. conference. So we greatly appreciate it. So Andrew, thank you for presenting, and I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Violet. I got to remind my um, marketing team to maybe shorten up my bio a little bit. That was a little long. Um, but uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, what I wanted to do today is talk about some of the new exciting things that we're doing at EBSCO. Um, and so I'm going to talk about two products today um, that we've been working on. One is something that um, is not so new and one that is very brand new. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit today about Panorama, which is our brand new, our latest and greatest product from here, uh, from here at EBSCO. We launched it just... Um, in March or April, so it's only a few months old now. Uh, and then I thought I would also talk about Open Athens as well, simply because there's been a lot of interest from uh, various different members within the SUNY organization about uh, about Open Athens. So I thought I would talk about that a little bit as well. Um, but I want to walk you through Panorama, our latest product from from EBSCO, um, why we're doing this, what it's all about, um, and why we're really excited about it. And and ultimately. Uh, Panorama is a reporting and analytics tool. Um, it's designed to give libraries insight into what's going on with the library, the collection, and um, some of the other things that we're working through now um, and helping some of our early adopters of the product do are things like being able to better understand the impact that the library is having on the educational program at the institution through student outcome analytics um, and some of the other aspects of what Panorama can do. So I want to walk you through, uh, walk you through that a little bit. Um, ultimately, we've seen a lot of change happen in libraries in the past 12 to 18 months. Um, we've seen this dramatic shift away from print usage. Um, as well as print uh, buying. Uh, libraries really kind of halted buying uh, print materials pretty much. And we also saw uh, print circulation uh, nearly go to zero in some cases. Um, and, and at that same time, we saw libraries start to make a big shift to making their collection available electronically. And we also around that same time saw a dramatic increase in usage of electronic resources. And libraries started thinking about, um, we need to make our collection readily accessible and available electronically. We, we were all kind of in this crazy position of what do we do? Um, what are we supposed to do in this situation where we have to close down physical access to the library's collection, um, yet continue to support an educational program? And um, libraries uh, were really pushing um, access for electronic resources. And we got a lot of questions here at EBSCO, you know, help me with this. What do I do? How do I uh, better understand how I should shape my collection to make sure that it is accessible uh, online and electronically? And, uh, and so Panorama was something that we had been working on uh, well before the pandemic. Um, but, but I think this was something that really pushed um, Panorama to be even more important. So um, kind of as I was just describing 
libraries, academic libraries specifically, really don't have tools to better understand how their collection is being used. We have counter reports, which gives us perspective one way, and we have maybe our proxy server logs or Open Athens gives us another view. Um, we might have our link resolver, we might have our discovery tool, we might have our library website. And all of these things are feeding us different uh, perspectives on the collection, circulation, um, gate counts, all these sorts of things are showing us how the library is used, but from different perspectives. We don't have a holistic view. And that's something that I think libraries really need is to be able to better make decisions about our collection. Um, we need to have a holistic view as to how the library is being used, uh, the impact the library's collection is, is making, maybe how that compares um, to other institutions uh, and to be able to better understand that. I know um, I used to work in a library many years ago. I remember doing things like surveys um, and comparing the uh, answers and the data that those surveys gave us to other programs, to other libraries, to other institutions. And there's so many different um, projects that we work on to try and tackle this, but we don't have that holistic view that brings all of that data together into a single place. And that's what EBSCO sent out to do several years ago. Gosh, we've probably been working on Panorama for about four years now at least, um, and, and try to pull together all of the library's data into a single place and be able to provide reports that uh, make sense and provide analytics so that we can better understand how our collection is being used and the value our collection has at our institution. And when we think about the different types of data that we bring into this collection, um, we're thinking about electronic data, like um, that first column is very EBSCO heavy and I apologize, it's not meant to be. Um, but thinking about the usage of your electronic resources with counter data, maybe your book jobber, like data about uh, who you're buying content through, um, being able to look at your collection and, being, and look at how it's being used, your discovery tool, um, getting your counter data to look at um, views and downloads and searches and, and better understanding of which resources are getting used. But that doesn't give you the whole picture either. That doesn't give you the picture of who is using that data. That doesn't give you the picture of, um, you know, what, their, what those users' backgrounds are, what programs, what status they are. Um, but then we start to look at ILS data, we can look at circulation activity, but we can't get that electronic resource usage data. But the circulation data can then tie into user demographics because it knows who's circulating that book. So there's a little bit more visibility. ILS data has acquisitions, it has financial information, it has um, holdings data. All of that can be really, really valuable to help bring this all together. Um, you know, another thing that we like to look at is usage of the library's services, not just usage of the electronic resources, usage of the print resources, but usage of the library librarians, um, usage of the buildings, um, usage of the facilities can also be really impactful to understand the impact that our library is making. I think if you were attending a library conference maybe five years ago, the number one topic in every single session was talking about renovating the first floor, renovating the library. Um, I remember going to conferences five years ago and thinking, all we're talking about is rebuilding the library, the physical building, right? Um, and now um, being able to have the opportunity to go and visit all of those buildings, it's really fun to see the end result and seeing how the how everybody's got a coffee cafe now in the, in the beginning, in the front entrance way of the library. And, um, a lot of people have moved away from the, um, the reference desk and now have an information desk, which is less intimidating and more helpful and broader in scope. And so all of these things are impacting how the library is used as well. And that, that plays a big role. Um, some libraries have been keeping track of how many instruction appointments they have or reference appointments they have and, and um, uh, the information literacy program and, and which classes they're interacting with and which classes they're not. But that's these all these different elements of data are all really, really valuable, but being kept siloed apart and separate and not allowing us to get a holistic view. Um, and then there's other sorts of systems as well that we've been envisioning and imagining um, about how we might be able to leverage data across the institution, across the campus, 
um, uh, and, and other aspects. And there's data elements out there that we haven't even thought of yet as well. So there's all sorts of different data points that we want to be able to consolidate and not just be able to report on individually, but bring it all together, mash it all up together and think about how we can get some insight into what's going on and how successful the library is. Being able to measure the library, uh, being able to identify, are there certain areas where we have a really great resource that's not getting used? Is there any areas where we're not getting enough usage um, in, in the collection? And how might, how might we address that? So these are the things that we set out to accomplish with Panorama. Um, in addition to that, something else that we learned as a part of our research when bringing this product out was just the sheer pain in collecting the usage data of the electronic resources, getting the counter data, um, bringing in counter reports, um, processing the counter reports, having spreadsheets coming out of our eyeballs um, and not being able to manage that. And so one of the things that we've identified as that being a big challenge is, um, and what we're supporting with Panorama is we are including a service that we have here at EBSCO, which we call our usage loading service. And this is a service where we here at EBSCO collect your counter reports on your behalf for your resources. And we bring that into our data warehouse to be able to provide reporting. We're very clear. We don't use this for resale activity. We don't sell your data. We bring this in just uh, on your behalf. We collect this data for you to automate that process so that you don't have to deal with all of the pain of collecting all of that counter reports, whether it's counter four, whether it's counter five, whether it's a publisher that has something that kind of looks like counter but isn't quite counter, or whether it's a, a publisher that will give you usage data but isn't anything related to counter. How do we get all of that data, massage it, and unify it so that we can report on it. Um, how do we do things like cost per use analysis uh, and better understand um, overlap as well of our electronic collections? So this is something that we've set out to solve as well as a part of Panorama. We include our usage loading service. This is where we are going to go out and collect your, your data for you, whether it's counter or non-counter data. We bring it in uh, into our repository and we provide the ability for you to get reporting off of that data through Panorama. Um, so it, it's this is something that if you're doing this yourself, you recognize how difficult and challenging this is to collect, um, collect that data. Um, a lot of times, even if it is counter compliant, it's not all counter reports are created equally. So there's a lot of massaging that needs to happen. Um, we go back and we'll collect um, the past two years of data as well, so that you have history to compare to when you first get started with, with this service. Um, so you're going to have all of you know last year's data of the year before, and then all of the current data going forward, uh, automatically loaded into the system. You have the ability to load the data yourself if you want to as well. So even if you wanted to go beyond two years and perhaps you wanted to go and collect more than that, you can load your, uh, your data yourself into the system as well. The biggest benefit here is that we're doing that loading for you. We're working with the data for you, um, which will be a huge time saver. Um, so let's take a look at what that what that all looks like. Uh, I really want to show you kind of the idea. So what Panorama provides is access into dashboards. Each dashboard is going to have several reports on it. You're going to get about a, a dozen or so dashboards with Panorama. Each dashboard tends to have somewhere around maybe five or six or so reports. So you're getting access to um, over 50 different reports that have been pre-designed pre-created by our librarians here at EBSCO. So they are designing the reports for you. Circulation reports, collection assessment reports, collection management reports, budget reports. All of these reports are created by our librarians here on staff at EBSCO. They're designing these reports for you, all the things that you would need, um, your, your average reports that you would need to analyze. Plus, also, you get the ability to create your own reports as well. So if there's something that you need to create on top of what we're already providing, you also have the ability to, to create your own dashboards and reports. So what I wanna do quickly is just walk you through some of the dashboards that we've pre-created pre here at EBSCO to help address some of these uh, challenges that libraries have. 
This first dashboard, I like to call this the library director's dashboard. This is that overview analysis, that top level view into uh, what's going on with the library. Um, and here you can see you have things like um, loan activity to get an understanding as to how the physical collection is circulating, as well as the size and growth and changes of the physical collection. You, uh, in the second row, you have uh, understanding as to the overall electronic resource uh, collection and how it's being used as well. So again, this, this what I think is kind of neat here. We've seen this across the board, across the globe. Um, uh, if you look at you know March, April timeframe of 2020, that circulation basically going to zero uh, in most cases. Um, and then um, around that same time, electronic resources uh, spiking uh, way above normal um, in most cases. It wasn't um, an overnight switch. There was a lull um, in seeing activities. And, and this, again, this is something that we've seen across the, across the board is um, it took a few months because I think there's so many people who are just, we didn't know what we were doing. A lot of things were put on pause. Um, but a few months later, we started to see this um, massive increase in electronic resources. Uh, and that, that stayed fairly, uh, fairly consistent for uh, a long while. We're, we're now seeing circulation activity coming back. Uh, print collections are starting to get used again. We're seeing um, through our Gobi platform, our, our book ordering platform, we're seeing libraries um, you know, coming back and saying, oh, you know, we didn't buy books for a whole year and there's some things that we need to get. So that's coming back and um, a little bit of normalcy is starting to flow back into libraries, which is really exciting to see. Uh, but this gives you that, that kind of view into how your library is, is being used right now from a high level perspective. Um, and as we start to drill down and look at different reports and dashboards, we can get more focused on um, what we need to analyze. So here in this case here, we're looking at uh, collection budget analysis. Um, so if we want to see, you know, uh, this library here, it looks like they, they started out their fiscal year with almost $7 million. So this is clearly a very large institution um, that, that uh, is using this. This is from one of our actual customers. Uh, we uh, kind of redacted it so that you were anonymizing it. We don't know which institution it is. Um, but this is an actual institution uh, nearing about seven million dollars in their in their budget, it looks like, um, and you can see how they spent that over over the year, um, over the fiscal year. You can see a lot of most of their most of their expenditures was you know towards the end of the calendar year and the early part of the next calendar year um, is where they spent mostly on electronic content, very uh, very much uh, what we would expect for an academic institution. Um, print has really kind of stayed static um, over. Um, you know, not much growth throughout the year. So they purchased some um, in that same time frame when they were doing their electronic expenses, but not a whole lot there. Um, and then you can also see uh, of those types of resources, of the electronic resources, of the physical resources and, and others, what is it more specifically that they're, that they're buying? Um, you know, perpetual access is, is a big one there. Um, online subscriptions, they've got a lot, uh, books. And so you can kind of see all of the different categories uh, and how that is being um, purchased. There's a lot more to this report, can't fit it all on the screen, but this is gonna give you a good understanding as to how the collections uh, budget is being worked. Um, and, and of course I can apply filters to this, I can change the timeframes, I can drill down and get more granular as I need to um, for, for that report or for that dashboard. Here we're looking at print circulation. So this is gonna give us a view into how the world of print is viewed and you can see um, in this first chart here where we have for this institution circulation activity in, in uh, this orangey reddish color um, and then uh, in the current year and then the previous year in uh, this light gray color just so you can kind of see how this institution was impacted by um, closing the library uh, for COVID. Uh, but for the circulation that did happen, you can see where that is happening. Um, and we can start to see now, what are the areas that are coming back uh, faster? What are the areas that are getting used right away? Um, so you can see circulation by physical location. You can see top circulated items by subject area, lots of different ways of understanding the circulation. Um, and again, you can apply filters to this. You can uh, adjust the date ranges. 
uh, get more granular as you need to um, and apply filters to adjust this. You can click on things and see the data update live in real time. Um, now, uh, counter to, uh, we were just looking at the print uh, circulation. Now we're looking at the electronic circulation. So here you can see the activity there. Um, like I said, um, we saw just a, a big increase in usage of the electronic resources. This were currently filtered down to eBooks. I think for this library, uh, we hadn't quite loaded their e-journals yet at the time that we took this screenshot, but we only had their eBook data loaded at the time. Um, so this is looking at their usage of their eBooks. Um, again, very similar. You can kind of see um, by publisher, by subject area, top resources, all of that sort of stuff is going to come out of um, the e-resource usage uh, as well. So I can get some better understanding as to how my electronic collection is being used. Um, this is another dashboard here that we've created for uh, this library happened to use Easy Proxy as their authentication tool. So we loaded the data that Easy Proxy has um, uh, into, uh, into Panorama so that you can also get a dashboard. Uh, in this case, this institution requires Easy Proxy authentication for their off-campus users. So this is a view into um, our off-campus usage. Um, something that has become obviously a much bigger uh, conversation with so many users becoming remote. Um, and so in that scenario, it's beneficial to have uh, a chart where we can see geographically where users are coming from, um, uh, being able to understand the users a little better, and being able to understand the usage that's coming in through uh, the proxy server. This is, the, this is the chart that I'm most excited about. I'm not gonna show you all of the charts and graphs and the dashboards. Like I said, Panorama right now has about a dozen or so. We're always adding new dashboards and new, new uh, reports. And as those dashboards and reports are created, they're pushed out to all of the users of Panorama. So you'll have access to them as they are created. Um, we're, we're generally creating a dashboard every month um, or so. So probably every month you're gonna have something new with Panorama to, to work with. Um, and we're right now prioritizing a lot of that with our active customers. So if you were to start to use Panorama, you could help to, to influence um, some of the new dashboards and reports that we're building. This, like I said, this is the one that I'm most excited about because this is something that academic libraries have been trying to uh, visualize and report on for a very, very long time. And I've never really successfully been able to do it in this fashion. Um, a lot of times it's done via one-off analysis or done by survey. In this case, this is something that is constantly being updated. Um, in some cases, updated on a daily basis, the data. So this is kind of a more live view into what's going on. And this is our student outcomes dashboard. This gives you visibility into how the library is impacting the educational program. Um, one of the things that I think is most telling is, I apologize, it's covered by this blue box on the right-hand side, but looking at the GPA per program. So here I can look at the different programs that I have at my institution. I can get the GPA or the grade point average uh, for that program to see how that program is doing, but also look at circulation data. Um, both of print materials as well as electronic materials. So I can get, um, I'm bringing in my counter data, I'm bringing in my, um, my circulation data into the uh, GPA uh, view. And this is gonna help me better understand maybe things like information literacy, my information literacy program, my outreach program, my liaison program. What are the different departments on campus that I need to spend a little bit more time with Maybe, maybe they have really high GPAs and I should focus elsewhere. Maybe they have low GPAs and we want to help improve that. Um, maybe they have low usage of the library's collection and we need to do better outreach. Maybe they have really high usage of the library program and we want to better understand if there's anything else that we can improve. So this is going to give us more data as a part of our liaison program when we're out there talking with our uh, our. our contacts out at the other departments, thinking about that, as well as being able to take some of this data and bring this to the provost, bring this to the chair of those departments to sit down and talk about, you know, maybe budget um, or the collection or how the library is supporting the educational program. This is going to give us some data to act on, and this is really valuable um, to, to think about, um, you know, from the educational program's who's using the library and vice versa. How is the library impacting the education, educational program on campus? So this is something that's really exciting. We're, we're pulling this data 
um, out of the student information system. Um, so this is something that's getting frequently updated. Uh, and this is going to be really insightful for libraries to be able to better understand this impact. And as you can see, it's a mashup of data, right? We're bringing in uh, circulation activity. We're bringing in patron information. We're bringing in uh, grade data from the from the university. We're bringing in electronic resource usage data. We're, we're, we're bringing in acquisitions data. We're bringing in collections data um, and creating a report across the across all of these different data elements to give us some real good visibility um, and to help facilitate some of those conversations that are happening uh, happening on campus. Um, this, this slide here just shows the ability that we have, uh, we provide the ability for you to um, filter and, and tweak the reports, and everything uh, related to that. Um, so this, I wanted to pause here. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I also wanted to briefly mention um, Open Athens as there's been within the SUNY organization quite a bit of interest with Open Athens. And I just wanted to walk through that really quickly. Maybe you've heard about Open Athens. Maybe you're saying, what is this thing? I just wanted to mention that. Um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes on that. So we'll come back. So if you have any questions related to Panorama, uh, hold on to them or put them into chat. We'll come back to chat and address your questions. Um, so feel free to go ahead and put those in there. Now I'm going to switch over to a different set of slides just to uh, quickly run you through uh, a little bit on Open Athens. So bear with me one moment while I while I do that. So um, for those of you who are wondering what is Open Athens, I keep hearing about this thing. Um, why does this why is this important to me and what should I know about it? I thought I would just spend a few minutes walking you through that. Um, so Open Athens is a, a product that we've created a partnership with. It's not something that we own here at EBSCO. We have a relationship with the organization um, that owns Open Athens, and we provide um, all of the customer support, all of the sales and marketing, um, all of the you know mainly customer facing issues and resolution and publisher relationships as well for Open Athens. So we have a very, very close relationship with one another. Um, we, uh, Open Athens, if you're not familiar, is owned by um, a nonprofit organization in the UK uh, called JISC, J-I-S-C. Uh, they, they really support um, education, uh, higher education um, in, in the UK, and they own the Open Athens group. Um, we work with them very closely to support uh, our customers with Open Athens, um, and they've brought a very great solution to libraries. Um, if you remember a few years back, there was a consortium, I'm sorry, a committee created uh, of a mixture of academic librarians and publishers. Um, and it was supported by NISO, the standards organization. And they created this initiative called RA21. Um, and really what the RA21 committee stated is that IP-based authentication is, is essentially a thing of the past. It no longer works. Um, it's no longer preferred, uh, and we need to design and standardize around an authentication technology uh, to support facilitating our patrons accessing content from our publishers. Publishers are pushing us to move away from IP authentication because it's just not secure. Uh, libraries are wanting to move away from IP authentication because of the challenges that are inherent with it. University IT departments are encouraging us to move beyond this as well. And so what is the next step? And that's what RA21 set out to do. And as a result of the, this working committee, um, they created seamlessaccess.org. Seamlessaccess.org is uh, an initiative to help facilitate seamless access, to help facilitate ensuring that patrons can access their publishers' platforms and website and access materials online um, in a seamless manner and a move beyond IP-based authentication, no longer using IP authentication, using a technology called SAML, S-A-M-L. SAML is really the de facto authentication technology. You probably use it every day and you, you might not even be aware of it. It's, it's technology that Google, Facebook, Microsoft, all of these companies have standardized on. This is the de facto standard for authentication technology. 
um, to help facilitate users from one group accessing uh, another service. Um, and so seamlessaccess.org is really pushing this within our community uh, with libraries and with publishers and helping to facilitate this process. Open Athens is a product that helps to implement this for libraries. It's really the only product out there uh, right now that helps facilitate um, uh, library patrons accessing publisher resources using SAML technology. Um, and we know that proxy servers are a challenge. Uh, proxy servers uh, require a tremendous amount of resourcing in order for them to work correctly. Uh, and this was this was stated right in this article here, um, which I can't read because my Zoom window is covering it. Uh, partnering with vendors to limit compromised user accounts. So this was an article in the in the journal, the Serials Librarian. I included the DOI there below if you want to access the article. Um, this article talks about the challenges of running and managing a proxy server um, and how really resource intensive it is in order for it to be used correctly. Um, and um, I sat in on an, a presentation at the ERNL conference a few years ago where they talked about um, uh, the, the security issues and how um, places like Sci-Hub and some of these other illegal repositories of content are sharing data because they've all been leaked through uh, proxy servers at academic institutions. So there's a clear push to move beyond proxy servers, IP authentication, and having a secure approach to facilitating mm -hmm. library patrons to access, access the content. Um, and, and even at OCLC, uh, the, the owners and maintainers of Easy Proxy have said, listen, um, we're no longer going to sell you uh, Easy Proxy to be hosted at your institution. You have to buy it through us because of the maintenance and the work around security. What they're basically saying is that institutions don't really have the resourcing to host it correctly and have it done well. You need to have a vendor support and manage your authentication service. So uh, there's this clear push to go away from having that at the institution level and allowing vendors who can specialize in creating a very uh, secure uh, environment to facilitate your patrons accessing um, the content. Open Athens implements that, but it implements that so much differently than Easy Proxy, which has kind of been the standard for authentication because Easy Proxy is exactly that, as a proxy server. Open Athens implements SAML technology, which is what the uh, committee behind figuring out what is next has defined to be the standard. So the standard moving forward is to use SAML technology. Open Athens implements that. It is a cloud-based service. It is hosted in Google's cloud environment. So it's highly secure. It's always available. And you get 24 seven customer support from EBSCO. It implements SAML technology, as I said, um, and it allows us to take advantage of all of the benefits that SAML technology brings to us. We are now authenticating an individual user versus authenticating an IP address from the institution, which we cannot um, guarantee is an affiliated user. Anybody can walk on campus, access the network and get a network uh, IP address and now have full access to the library's resources. We need to constrain that. We need to control who has access based off of the licensing. Um, we also might wanna be able to say, hey, you're an alumni. You can access our electronic resources, but only some of them, maybe not all of them. How do we control that? Just because they have uh, the permission to access campus resources doesn't mean they have access to access everything. So we need to be able to have that level of control as well. On top of all of that, we want to be able to report on all that. We were just talking about this with Panorama. Open Athens has built in its own usage reporting mechanism with Easy Proxy. Uh, they just launched a reporting tool as well. It's an additional cost um, to, to, to uh, add that onto your existing subscription with them. With Open Athens, it is built in. All implementations of Open Athens include access to the reporting system that's built in so that you can get visibility into uh, how your users are accessing uh, your library's resources, your electronic resources. And built into the usage reporting is because we are categorizing users, thinking about 
This person's an alumni. This person's an undergraduate. This person's a faculty member. We can now start to create visualization of the library's resources, of the usage of the library's resources based off of the status of the individual, based off of the category. And what's great is you get to choose and create your categories. You can create whatever category you want. You can get as granular as you want. You can get as basic as you want with your categories. Uh, you have full control to determine those categories because that information is coming from your university's directory system. Um, so whatever uh, information about the user you have, you can create your own users. Um, and so that, that benefit there is, is uh, that you can get much more uh, granular level of reporting, get visibility into who is using the electronic resource, not specifically an individual person, but a cohort of users, okay? And like I said, you can define what those cohorts are. Um, we don't store usernames and passwords and personally identifiable information in our environment. We're just storing the reporting data. So it's, we're not storing anything that's going to cause any privacy alarms or any issues related uh, to that in, in the reporting environment. Last Thank but not Nancy. least. Nancy, I'm just oh, going to jump in. Um, Megan has some questions going back to Panorama and then Violet, I think her question is related to Open Athens. So Megan, um, if you want well, can, we, can we just hold that? I'm almost done the Open Athens. Can oh, we, sure. The Apologies. Okay. Sorry, um, I just wanted to wrap this up. We're just about done with Open Athens and then I'll take all, all the questions. Uh, but the last thing I want to say about Open Athens is that it is fully managed. So one of the other big benefits that we have with Easy Proxy is, is that you have to be responsible for maintaining those stanzas, making those configurations. When a publisher makes a change, you have to make those changes as well here with Open Athens, because we are maintaining all of the connectivity with the publisher's platforms, we handle all of that work. And because we're moving away from IP-based authentication, we are, um, we are now leveraging SAML technology, which doesn't have those same challenges. Um, SAML technology works very differently from IP authentication. It makes a more seamless interaction. So you don't have those configurations at the publisher you know, platform to determine how that's all going to be configured. It's it's going to be um, based off of the uh, the connection with those publisher platforms. So we're relying on IP authentication much less. Um, there are still some publishers out there that require IP authentication. They don't support SAML technology, and Open Athens does have the ability to create that proxy based interface. But we're moving away from that as much as possible. And you're going to find that the vast majority of your resources are going to leverage SAML technology for creating that connection with your users. So I think that was the last thing that I wanted to identify here um, uh, as, as a part of that. We have uh, about 15 or 20 minutes left in the session. So at this point, I'm happy to take questions about Open Athens uh, and Panorama as well. And Nancy, I think you said there's a few questions in chat there. So why don't we uh, why don't we jump into that and see what we have here? Uh, let's see. Megan says she has several questions. Yeah, feel free to um, Megan if if you have questions. If you want to come off of mute, uh, I don't think we have too many people that it's going to be overbearing. So please feel free to uh, go off mute and ask your questions. All right. So I apologize. I am not super versed in and statistics and data gathering. Um, I'm the instruction librarian at my institution and I gather instruction stats and we are trying to rethink how we do that at my institution. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, I have several questions. Um, can, I, can I have my, my colleagues report into Panorama their instruction stats and then will it pull a report for me? And then unrelated to instruction, can, like, can I connect Alma and Primo to Panorama so that I can get like live time collection data. And third question, and I think it's my last, can you do pull reports by call number? We're in the middle of a renovation right now and I've got, I've had some colleagues try to figure out data by call number, like the PQs or whatever, and, and information based on that. And that was a lot, so I apologize. <laughs> That's quite all right. Okay, uh, so the first question was around tracking 
um, maybe your, um, your instructional appointments or your reference appointments? Um, and so the answer is yes and no. So Panorama does not have a tool to enter data into it. It pulls data from an existing place. So if you are tracking all of those reference appointments somewhere in a spreadsheet or some sort of database or somewhere where you're tracking that, Panorama creates a connection to that resource and pulls the information in on a periodic basis, maybe on a daily basis, it's gonna update that information. So we can work with you to figure out exactly how that data would be processed and loaded and maybe the best way to store that information. Um, but it doesn't have like a data entry system where you're entering in that data into Panorama. It's gonna pull that from your systems. So that's really the design of Panorama. The second question I think was about Alma and Primo. Yes, we have Panorama libraries libraries that are using Panorama for analytics that are also using Alma and Primo um, as their main ILS system with their OPAC or discovery system. And absolutely, yes, you, we can pull in your acquisitions data, your other data elements with, um, with Alma. Um, we can pull in data from Primo to get understanding of usage, like search results and how, you know, activity like that. So yes, we can, we can pull that data in um, for, for reporting, and we do that across a number of different ILS systems. Uh, and then the third question, you're going to have to remind me. <laughs> uh, can you get data specifically on call numbers? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. So um, like I said, you know, you're going to get somewhere around a dozen or so different dashboards. Each dashboard is going to have 50 or so reports, uh, five reports or six. So you're going to have about 50, 60 reports available to you. You also have the ability to create your own reports. Um, so library, you know, um, we're working on a weeding report right now. We kind of have something that kind of looks like a weeding report, um, but we're working on a more formalized report. If, um, you know, uh, I had a question at a presentation I did just the other day where a librarian wanted to do something like, uh, well, we had a lot of books that were checked out before we shut the library down during COVID. We didn't have enough time to jump on it. We've got all these books that checked out. They've been checked out for 18 months. What do we do with it? We need to, we need to get a report. So you can build things like that. You could do call number reports. You can take take any data elements that we're bringing into the system, and you can create your own reports on that. Um, so it has its own report building interface, um, and we can provide training on how to how to do that, um, uh, as well as documentation on how to do that. And then you can go in and create your own reports uh, as well. So if you want to create a report that says, "Give me everything," sorry, I'm a computer scientist. So everything in the, was a QA76 is computer science, right? So give me everything in the QA76 section and maybe give me uh, all of the circulation counts for the past 10 years, because we want to weed that. Um, that's something that you could, you could pretty easily create. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, did anybody else have questions? <laughs> No, I had submitted a question just about the uh, re oh. report. Oh, yes, right here. Uh, Sorry. Just, just creating, um, can a report be created for non-accessible content? So if a user gets a 404 message, um, would that generate, would we be able to generate reports for that? Yeah, we get that question a lot. We don't have anything that does that, generally because um, um, when you click on a link, it's not the system that creates the link that sees that it's the end user. So um, there are some third party tools out there that um, will do like link scanning and crawl your library's website and click on every link and identify when there's a, a 404 error or something like that. If you are using one of those um, services, uh, we could pull that data into, into, full, into Panorama, uh, but Panorama does not have direct access into those dead links and things like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see your question there. I think I was scrolling up, not down, I apologize. Um, I think I got through all the questions there. So um, if there's no other questions, you can have 15 minutes left on your, uh, on your agenda here to take a stretch your legs and take a break. Uh, I'm sure you guys have a very busy agenda for today. But I uh, wanted to thank you all for joining. Thank you, Andrew. We appreciate you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Violet.
Thank you. Good to see everyone. Good seeing you, Nancy. All right. Well, take care. Enjoy the rest of your conference um, and the rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.